Okay, so um, let's see. This whole this whole idea started to come around because uh, one of our great friends around Melbourne has, of course, he has his uh, morning weed and his afternoon and his carefully curated sort of use of cannabis throughout the day. Uh, and this <laughs> has really had me thinking about how how and why this should be the case that somebody's um, experiences of cannabis, and this is obviously makes perfect sense to people who use cannabis. So there's nothing new there. But I, I really wanted to start to explore that idea, um, more or less in the terms that have been uh, developed, uh, the framework that's been developed over the last uh, 20 years or so. And so the concept of the entourage effect I find quite fascinating and it could apply uh, well beyond um, the cannabis field, uh, possibly into the field of psychedelic research and, uh, and clinical practice. So we're going to go on a magical mystery tour on the entourage effect. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background and then we'll just sort of uh, work towards the sort of the thera therapeutic and eventually the experiential aspects of cannabis, which could be relevant there. So just a little bit of history. Of course, cannabis, as we know, is widely distributed throughout the world. It started probably in the temperate zones of Eurasia and spread uh, both east and west. Um, there are early studies, of course, but they're unrecorded as far as we know. We don't have easy access to uh, the research into cannabis by, uh, by um, cultures other than the Western uh, European cultures. Um, but of course, in Europe and North America, cannabis was a very popular uh, medicinal uh, compound and, uh, and so it was studied quite rigorously through the 19th century and into the 20th century, of course. And as uh, techniques for analysis uh, became more sophisticated, then uh, basically the, the results that were achieved or, or gained um, also w uh, gave us greater insight into the, just the, the complexity of cannabis compounds and then also their, um, their therapeutic effects. So the, uh, the efforts to isolate um, and identify the major uh, chemical constituents took place in the 19th century and it was only really in the early 1900s that major breakthroughs were made in terms of working out just how complex the mixtures were and what those compounds were. So cannabinol or cannabinol was, uh, was isolated in the early, uh, late 1890s and early 1900s. And then delta-9 THC tetrahydrocannabinol was um, identified and then synthesized in the 60s. So there was a lot of research in the early part of the uh, 20th century, but it was only uh, as chromatographic techniques really evolved um, uh, that the compounds were fully isolated. Uh, cannabidiol in the 60s and then other canna uh, cannabinoids in the 70s and then it was after that um, that a whole range of other compounds were identified, isolated, identified and their potential importance for the uh, effects of cannabis uh, were eventually recognised. So that's cannabis research and here we talk about cannabinoid research and so that really only took place um, with the concept of receptors as a, uh, as, a, as a concept in physiology in the second half of the 20th century. So cannabis effects were originally uh, thought or postulated to be membrane based because uh, the cannabinoids were known to be lipophilic, in other words they, they um, gravitate more towards uh, fatty lipid membranes. Um, but it was uh, with the advent of receptor science and then uh, more refined te uh, research techniques which finally confirmed uh, the involvement of the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. And uh, not long after that, the endocannabinoid uh, system was proposed and then uh, it, was rec uh, it was identified. And it's in the last couple of years that, uh, in fact, uh, the CB1 and CB2 receptors have been uh, crystallised and their structures have been elucidated. Uh, the simultaneous research into s synthetic cannabinoids, which of course have be, was spoken about yesterday by, by Nick uh, Wallace, um, also shed further light on, this, on the cannabinoid receptor system. And there's certainly uh, further scope for research into the uh, cannabinoid receptor system, um, both within the brain and the, and the central nervous system and also in the peripheral system. So moving on to the entourage effect, what is the entourage effect? Well, of course we know that the cannabis plant, uh, now know that the cannabis plant contains uh, myriad components. Um, there are over 100 uh, cannabinoids, 60 uh, terpenoids, which are very closely chemically related compounds, uh, 20 or so flavonoids, which are similar to what generally colouring compounds, 
um, and then alkaloids and another you know, range of other compounds. Now, of course, uh, as you'll know, THC and CBD, which is tetrahydrocannabinol and, uh, and cannabidiol, are in the highest concentration, but of course, the others are there in much smaller concentrations individually, but together they do make up quite a significant uh, proportion of the plant's compounds. Uh, any or all of these other compounds, um, they may uh, have impacts, effects on the pharmacology of the major constituents, and that's really the, um, the essence of the concept of the entourage effect. Uh, and so these uh, other compounds might have impacts um, not only on the pharmacology, but hence the, um, uh, the therapeutic effects. And then eventually they may also modulate the experiential or phenomenological effects of the major constituents. Uh, I'll throw up a little bit of chicken wire just because I can, and I hope you all suffer for it. Um, so there's the range of what we call the phytocannabinoids, which are the um, plant, the natural plant cannabinoids. And the two that I've, uh, two bits of chicken wire I've put up there are, of course, delta-9 THC and uh, cannabidiol. Uh, and this is really just to start. There's still a, a whole swag of compounds that we haven't uh, characterised to any degree. But as you can see, they, they all have this rather similar um, s skeleton or framework, structural framework. And so there are very subtle um, changes that can be um, seen in the framework from one compound to another. And it's really quite surprising to me and I think to other people just how um, how different the effects of uh, these various compounds can be just simply on the basis of, uh, say, one hydroxyl group um, or one, uh, one bond being, uh, being broken. And really what that means is that the, the compounds change, they differ very subtly in terms of both their, um, their shape, their conformation, and also their electrostatics. In other words, their, the uh, distribution of electrical charge uh, around the molecule. Uh, and so these can actually have quite profound uh, impacts on the way they uh, bind in receptors. In, in many cases, these compounds won't actually bind in the cannab uh, cannabinoid receptors themselves. And so that's the basis for our thinking that perhaps they, uh, they may be binding at other receptors or even non-receptor types at all, and that could well be modulating their, their effects. Now this slide is, um, don't expect you to read it, but just to show you that there's been quite a significant amount of research already uh, done into characterising the individual um, physiological therapeutic effects of a number of these um, cannabinoids. Uh, and also on the right hand side, um, the, there's the, the um, potential interactions between these compounds and the terpenoid compounds that I'll be going, uh, going through in a minute. Uh, if anybody wants to grab the, um, the reference, it's actually a really good read. This is a review of the um, potential interactions between um, cannabinoids and terpenoids specifically. And it's written by um, a, a guy called Ethan um, Rousseau who is uh, consulting to GW Pharmaceuticals, which is one of the major um, cannabis-based pharmaceutical companies in the world. So the endocannabinoids were um, originally hypothesized and then eventually identified. And these are the, actually the compounds which uh, circulate in our own systems in, in healthy individuals. And they are the, uh, what we would call the endogenous or the internal uh, natural ligands for, uh, for the receptors in our own systems. And there's n almost no question that these receptors also um, occur in all higher animals, higher mammals, birds, probably reptiles, I'm not sure. I haven't, uh, I haven't actually seen just how far back in our evolutionary sort of history um, the uh, cannabinoid receptor system uh, uh, extends. But uh, these are the four main um, uh, agents which are actually, despite their long names, they're all s circulating in our systems as we speak right now. The terpenoids are very interesting because they're um, they're very aromatic. I think there was a talk a little bit earlier about those. Uh, and they're the aromatic um, aroma compounds that uh, are, have been identified to have quite significant um, psychotropic effects on their own. Uh, and so I've just put three structures up. And you can see that, that, that they're actually quite diverse in their structures. They're not just sort of simple, straightforward. But they are actually all synthetically relatively straightforward because they all occur in plants in particular. Uh, and they are, um, they're actually derived from the same um, single basic compound in, in plants as the uh, cannabinoids are. This next slide also shows that there's been research into the effects in, in 
human um, of these various compounds, so they have been studied quite extensively. And then on the right hand side you'll see in that table, if you can check down the, um, the paper, the putative um, interactions with cannabinoids as well. The next one is uh, synthetic cannabinoids, although the top three, as you can see, are, um, are the uh, phytocannabinoids. Um, but the series down below are um, compounds which have been uh, formulated over the years in order to uh, shed light on the cannabinoid receptor system. Uh, and of course, as Nick mentioned yesterday, a number of these have found their way into um, into chronic and um, synthetic cannabis um, products, pretty much just as simply as a consequence of the prohibition of cannabis over all these years. Now the receptors, just very simply, receptor 101. Um, receptors are membrane-bound um, proteins. Uh, they are pretty much ubiquitous throughout our brains and our uh, nervous systems. And they basically uh, modulate our um, behaviours and our physiological processes on the basis of uh, binding of what we call lig uh, ligands. Or, uh, or, yeah. And the ligands divide out into uh, ligands which will activate or deactivate the uh, receptors for which they are um, exquisitely, um, beautifully uh, matched. And so in terms of activity, there's what we call a lock and key model. So if you can imagine the kind of specificity of a lock that has uh, 30 or 40 perhaps different um, parts to its, to its um, main key length, um, then you could see that the, there can be really a very significant sort of um, specificity of some ligands for, uh, for their receptors. And the ligand binding itself is very important in terms of both the, um, the duration of binding, so it's, it comes down to how how strongly a, a ligand binds to, uh, to its receptor and also the duration. And these are very closely sort of tied together, but of course anybody who is familiar particularly with these um, uh, synthetic cannabinoids, it really doesn't take very much to, to have a profound impact. Uh, and it's similar in fact to, to uh, LSD uh, being the most potent of the psychedelics that we know of as well. It really doesn't take too many molecules kicking around the system to, to elicit a, a very, um, very profound uh, effect. Uh, as you can see just in the bottom, I'm not sure if I can, I won't bother trying to point, but uh, in the bottom right hand um, figure you can see that the receptor is actually uh, a protein that is embedded in the, in the lipid membrane, uh, which is basically the surface of the, of the neuron cells. So the cannabinoid, sorry about the quality of this particular slide, but the cannabinoid receptors, uh, CB1 and CB2, are, are ostensibly quite similar in structure, but in fact there are some significant uh, differences between them that have been elaborated really over the last uh, three to four years by research groups in, uh, in the USA. So as far as the CB1 versus the CB2 receptor is concerned, of course CB1 receptor is the principal target of THC. Uh, it's also the principal one uh, activated by the endocannabinoids in the brain. Uh, and it has therapeutic implications for pain management, as you can see, inflammation, uh, obesity, and, uh, and substance use. And so the, the structure here that uh, was um, published in 2016 is the CB1 receptor in complex with a, a synthetic cannabinoid that was, uh, that was designed and synthesized specifically for that project. Now the CB2 is mainly expressed in the immune system rather than in the brain and the CNS. Uh, and then modulation, selective modulation of CB2 um, in the absence of, uh, of um, activity at the CB1 receptor seems to have uh, therapeutic potential specifically for inflammatory uh, and neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, it does, uh, let's see, there, there's a distinctly different binding pose uh, of the endogenous ligands and probably a number of the introduced or the chemical ligands between CB1 and CB2. However, once uh, an agonist is bound to the CB1 um, receptor, it seems to have uh, quite a similar uh, structure confirmation to uh, the CB2 when it has an antagonist bound. I won't go into too much detail at all, but an agonist is the one that activates a receptor and an antagonist tends to deactivate the receptor. And so this, um, this leads to a, a, a effectively an explanation, a hypothesis that um, the CB2 receptor seems to act through antagonism rather than agonism, whereas the CB1 acts through, uh, through agonism. Uh, 
So moving just on to the, some of the concepts, the, the finer concepts of the entourage effect. Firstly, synergism, which is um, a, basically a, um, a, a cooperation between uh, compounds binding at a site, which seem to have a disproportionate impact on what you'd expect just simply to, uh, from being the, uh, to be the, uh, the simple additive effects. Competition is the obverse of that, so when you have two compounds which are competing but one of them seems to be um, deactivating the, um, the receptor compared with uh, activating. Um, Cross-modulation is where you might have a couple of receptors which are co-localised in a membrane and this happens quite commonly in a, in a, um, a process called heterodimerization. Uh, and they can, uh, they can actually modulate the activity of each other of different receptors through this crosstalk um, possibility. And then allosterism is the binding of another compound at a place where the normal uh, compound doesn't bind for acti activation. And so um, this is just all to say that the entourage effect is probably much more complex and probably a lot more boring <laughs> than I'm, uh, even than I'm making it out now. Um, but uh, it really shows that there's a lot, to, a lot to understand, um, and we're really just at the very uh, early stages of that. So just going back to that concept of entourage effect, remember that um, any of these smaller, um, lower concentrated uh, concentration um, cannabinoids in cannabis plant, for example, still could um, have a significant impact on the pharmacology of those major constituents due to their just very subtle interactions um, through those four um, modulatory um, processes that I explained a moment ago. So this may also have an effect on the um, non-psychoactive therapeutic effects in terms of, for example, inflammation and so on. Uh, and that, of course, is the uh, focus of a lot of the cannabis medical research, which I'm sure a few of you will be familiar with. Um, but also then this could affect the morning, afternoon, evening um, uh, effects and, and the choice of effects of cannabis users in non-clinical settings. So how could we study entourage effect? Not super easy, and it's, uh, it's usually pretty geeky um, lab research. This case study is, um, is actually studying <coughs> um, THC and uh, versus a cannabis um, preparation, which was pretty much an, an extract um, titrated to the same concentration added of THC. So what that meant was that they generally had sort of one to two percent of other um, cannabinoids, including CBD, which is probably lower than most, most of us would be expecting CBD to be in, in therapeutic preparations. So I guess we have to sort of take that as a bit of a caveat. But what the graphs at the, on the, the, top, uh, the top row of the graphs on the right showed is that there is actually a significant impact on breast cell uh, um, proliferation. Um, between the cannabis uh, THC and the cannabis drug PrEP. And the differences are small, but they are larger than you would expect on the basis of that sort of um, difference in the um, uh, concentrations of the, or the contribution of those other uh, cannabinoid uh, compounds. Just moving on, just the question, um, is, is there actually anything wrong with single compounds? Because there's quite a, there's, there's always a debate, uh, not only in the cannabis community, but in the psychedelic community as well. Um, and so, uh, for one thing, single pure compounds are favoured in research because they, um, they enable us to characterise the effects of these, those single compounds. Um, it's very much still a reflection of that sort of reductionist uh, model. Of, uh, of medical research and explanation of, uh, of effects in physiology. Um, but the use of single compounds does enable us to titrate uh, optimal doses for, for, um, for desired outcomes. Um, and it also uh, assists in identifying placebo effects in the clinical um, research uh, context. But complex mixtures, of course, may be more therapeutically beneficial um, for the reasons that I guess I've, I've been sort of alluding to up until now. And there also could be the amelioration of unwanted effects uh, through the down, um, the down regulation uh, of, uh, for example, THC, which is an agonist by CBD, which is an antagonist at the, uh, at the various, the, the two receptor systems. And the bottom line really is, of course, that the entourage effect uh, is only possible with mixtures. So if, the, if we do feel ultimately that we, um, uh, that we regard entourage effect as something to explore and potentially to utilise for therapeutic benefit, 
then of course we, we will need to use uh, mixtures of, of compounds. Uh, one thing to consider, I guess, and, and I haven't put a slide up about it, is that uh, there's also quite a lot of debate about whether uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic compounds, and I'm not talking about synthetic cannabinoids, but I'm talking about synthesised versions of the uh, naturally occurring phytocannabinoids, um, are uh, different experientially to uh, the, um, the natural, let's see, purified versions of those natural compounds themselves. And I don't think we really have any easy way of saying at the moment because I don't really think there's been enough research into that. Uh, but um, hopefully that will come. And I think there's, a, there's, uh, there's actually a lot to be discovered about that. Um, there'll be people who, of course, feel that, the, um, that even compounds, single compounds extracted from plants have uh, a, different, a different chemical history from those synthesised in a laboratory. I can't really get into that conversation simply because I don't know, but I do hope that we can start to, to shed some light on that uh, as time goes on. So as far as, um, as far as the therapeutic applications are concerned, we can really only uh, explore those through research. Of course, there's, there's um, a huge amount of collective human experience with, these, with um, cannabis and, uh, and their preparations and their therapeutic applications, of course, but um, we really still... Um, have to regard those as uh, as community knowledge until we really have sort of a, a better understanding of how and why they they, they work, and so this knowledge will of course uh, inform uh, breeding programs to try and optimise the, the the mixtures of the um, the proportions, for example, of these other smaller uh, lower concentration cannabinoids, along with uh, THC and CBD. Uh, but of course we have a long and rich future ahead of us in terms of research and, uh, and clinical application. Uh, now I've blasted through this a bit quickly, I hope you're able to follow. Uh, maybe I should have put another 16 slides in, what do you reckon? <laughs> but um, here we are, we're on the entourage effect um, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Any questions? Any questions for Martin? Oh, good. Oh, we good. We have uh, a plan here. <laughs> uh, I'm actually still trying to structure a question in my head, but maybe just talk a little bit. You start. You started off saying um, that it's not just um, with cannabis uh, that the entourage effect happens, and, and presumably this is a particularly interesting issue for any uh, psychoactive substance that comes from a plant because you've got a whole bunch of other chemicals in there. So, is there any research going on, or maybe just yeah, anything that that you can. Uh, delve into about that. I'm glad you asked me that question, <laughs> Nick. Thank you. This was actually a, um, this was in part a, uh, a bit of a practice talk for a talk I'll be giving at the um, Entheogenesis Australis so EGA uh, little mini symposium in Melbourne next week. It's called Garden States. Uh, and I'll be extending this concept to, um, to other uh, nature-based psychedelics, so from plants, fungal um, sources, and potentially from anim one or two animal sources as well. Uh, so, yeah, look, I reckon that we could extend that quite comfortably to the, particularly the plant and fungal derived psychedelics. Uh, and so I guess a, a two major, two main cases in point would be psilocybin and the various other sort of methylated tryptamines that, that are, um, that do occur naturally in psilocybin and similar um, uh, mushroom species. Uh, and to, as far as I know, there has been some research into the uh, effects of um, isolated and purified um, biocystin, which is the one single methylated, and norbiocystin, which is the non-methylated psilocybin or psilocin. Uh, and although they're not considered to be psychoactive in their own uh, right, as far as we know, um, there's still that potential, I think, for this um, entourage effect to, to, to come into play. I think another one which is still a mystery but perhaps um, maybe slightly more, um, more thought about so far is the wide range of alkaloids which are present in, um, in Trichocereus in particular or Echinopsis um, cacti. And uh, 
And so uh, there's, there's anecdotal, uh, there have been many anecdotal reports of differences in experiential effects of uh, the columna um, trichocereus cacti versus um, Lophophora uh, peyote. Uh, and Lophophora is supposed to have, I think, a narrower, uh, I may be wrong there, but I think it has a narrower spectrum of naturally occurring mescaline analogues. Uh, and so there's there's plenty of um, plenty of scope I think to explore that as well. We could move on to ayahuasca um, and um, and I guess more specifically the methylated tryptamines, uh, dimethyltryptamine, and so on. Um, and I think it really just is uh, we're we're probably just at the doorstep of some really really interesting research in that regard. Yes. Uh, any more questions for Martin? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's Nick. Not anyone. I was just going to ask as a, as a follow-up to that, why did we end up focusing on certain um, certain chemicals like THC and CBD? Is it just because they're the highest quant in quantity and easiest to, to discover? Or what, why is there certain focus, like we focus on DMT in um, uh, acacias and we focus on mescaline in... Why these chemicals and not other chemicals? I think it's because you get the biggest bang for the buck out of THC. There's no question that it's that that it is the um, the compound that is the most um, clearly psychoactive in, in all of those, uh, and so that, I think that's why it makes this concept of the entourage effect so difficult to 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 explain or to explore. Uh, I believe that um, before Delta 9 THC was isolated and characterised, there was another one which was called Delta 6A. 10A, um, and it was found back in the um, in the 1920s and 30s to be effective in dogs. I don't know if they gave it to humans. I think there were probably less um, uh, there were less restrictions on human research then than there are now. But nonetheless, they may still have balked at that. I'm not sure. But anyway, so um, a form of THC was. Uh, was found to be active even back then, and I think they can go back even to the to the 1850s. Um, and so, the main issues there were I think there was some mischaracterisation because uh, cannabinol itself was thought to be um, quite psychoactive, but it turned out I think to be an impurity of THC, and that really just simply reflected difficulties in separating those very very closely chemically related compounds. Um, so. Uh, I'm not quite sure um, to what degree we can really um, further characterise the psychotropic effects of these, but I think uh, what we're really looking at is, is subtle non-psychoactive modulation of, of these compounds. Yeah, of, sorry, of the major uh, psychoactive compounds. Okay, yep. Uh, I just—I don't know whether you can explain this, but uh, what's the scientific explanation using, you know, with the cannab endocannabinoid system for some when someone first smokes a dope and gets really doesn't get stoned at all, and later on, you know, they become much more attuned to that stone. Hmm. What's, what's the scientific explanation for that? I, my suspicion is that it comes down to the upregulation of receptors in response to a to an external agonist. So um, many receptors, in, in fact probably all receptors and particularly the CNS receptors do tend to, um, let's see, their, their, ex their genetic expression and the, the actual synthesis of those proteins um, is increased by the, um, by the exposure to, um, to stimula you know, stimulating um, uh, influences such as bringing in exogenous um, cannabinoids. So I reckon it's probably just because um, our, our own sort of brains are very, very finely tuned in terms of maintaining a homeostasis or just a steady level of activity. And so it's quite possible. Uh, I, didn't get into, um, I didn't get into this at all, but I, I can go into it for a moment if we have time. Um, it's quite possible that these uh, endogenous um, ligands are a present in very, very small concentrations. And I was talking a little bit about activity and binding, you know, strength of binding and duration of binding, that sort of thing. And it could be that they either bind extremely tightly, I don't have numbers um, here, but um, extremely tightly or not terribly tightly at all. And so they might sort of modulate uh, or the activity of those receptors to a certain level. 
And so normally when you flood the system with, um, with a much higher concentration of, um, of an external cannabinoid in this case, then the immediate response is, to, is for the system to try and upregulate to, to be able to accommodate on the expectation that this could happen, strangely enough, again, one time. So um, yeah, that, that tends to be the case. But that also can play the other way. So sometimes you get tolerance, of course, and that, that also can be through upregulation of expression, but then downregulation of activity, which, which is getting well beyond the, the scope of this, um, this talk. Um, so when you say upregulation, do you mean that there will be an increase in the number of receptors? Correct, yep. Okay. So that's, that's um, although the very last thing I said as well could also apply. So, but yes, well, I, was, I was referring specifically to the, the genetic switches. So yeah. um, when the gene is read to RNA and then, so that's transcription and then translation, yeah. which is the production of the protein from the RNA, um, that whole process tends to increase in, in um, frequency. And so you'll get a, a, a higher number, and hence a higher concentration of receptors in particular parts of the brain. Thank you. Mm. And also that applies to other parts of the body, of course. So, you know, it's not just the CNS. That can happen anywhere in the, in the peripheral system as well. Okay. Uh, look, thank you so much, Martin, for coming and thank sharing you. that very um, detailed information with us. Fun. It's awesome.